My message today is Ask Anything. You can see the title behind me, Ask Anything. And it's a, we're continuing a series on the Lord's Prayer where Jesus himself taught us to pray. Today in Matthew chapter 6, we come to the part that many of us love, and that is the give me part, the petitioning part, the asking God for our needs part of the prayer where Jesus was taught us to pray. And, if, and there's nothing wrong with that because Jesus himself invited us to pray in this way. But he said in Matthew 6, uh, he taught us to pray, starting in, in verse 9, our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. So we get to the fourth part of the prayer today where we see give us this day our daily bread. Give. It speaks of a dependence, a daily dependence on God for our needs, for provision, for direction, for that which we uh, need in life. And, in, and more than that, it's an invitation from God. He's teaching Jesus himself, teaching us to pray in this way. So it's an invitation to us to ask God, to ask him to meet the needs we face in life, to meet, uh, and, the, and the scriptures say, Jesus said, ask anything in my name. So ask anything. Thing. Jesus himself invited us to do that. And the scripture says he will withhold no good thing from those who seek him. So what does this mean? What does this mean for us? How do we ask? Uh, for what should we ask? And what should we expect? We're exploring that in the moments we have together. And to do so, we'll look at three elements. Three elements today to get the most out of what I called petition prayer. That's the give me prayer, petitioning God for our needs. Three elements today to get the most out of this type of petition prayer. Number one, the first element to get the most out of this asking God for our needs. Number one, confidence. We must have confidence. Confidence, it cannot be understated confidence cannot be understated. The scripture tells us, and I don't have them all on screen, I'm going to quote a lot of scriptures today, not all of them on screen, but in Hebrews chapter 4, we are told that we must come with confidence or come boldly to God, come boldly to his throne of grace in time of need to receive. We, have to have, we must have confidence, cannot be understated. In the Hebrews 10, it says that we must have confidence to receive the reward that we get from seeking him, but it says we must have confidence. God himself is saying we must have confidence uh, with him. It cannot be understated. And you can say, well, how can I have confidence in this life? Well, we can have confidence in God, number one. It's been said that confidence, I mean, not sorry, not confidence, but that God knows our tomorrows better than we even know our yesterdays. Think about that. God knows our tomorrows better than we even know our yesterdays. But when it comes to God and his, what he's done for us through Christ Jesus, I think of our yesterdays and, you know, the scripture tells us that our yesterdays have been sealed uh, in forgiveness. That's the message of the cross. That's the message of the resurrection. That's the message of Christ, that our yesterdays, and this gives us confidence, by the way, that knowing that our yesterdays have been sealed in forgiveness. The scripture says that in Christ, this new covenant, that the handwriting requirements of the law that were set against us, that were made us guilty, have been removed. And as Jesus says in the scriptures, I remember your sins no more. Yes, my friend, that our past has been, your past has been sealed in forgiveness. And now when we come to God in prayer, and in the, t t today we're talking about asking Him in prayer, we're to come with our conscience, in fact it says evil conscience, but our guilty conscience cleansed by the blood of Christ, knowing that our past is and has been forgiven. We're given these promises that should give us confidence in prayer, confidence in asking, because God said we must have confidence. The scripture says that even when our own hearts condemn us, he does not. The scripture says even when we're faithless, he is still faithful. This is a wonderful promise that should give each of us confidence in prayer, knowing that he is not holding our wrongs against us, and he has mercy and grace toward us. We can't always change what happened in the past, but if we receive his mercy now, we can change the future moving forward. We have confidence in tomorrow. How do we know we have confidence in tomorrow as believers? Well, the scripture tells us, gives us this great promise, 1 John chapter 4, but it, by this love is perfected so that we may have confidence 
in the day of judgment. Confidence in the day of judgment. Because as he is, so are we also in this world. So we can have confidence in tomorrow that our future is secure in Christ Jesus. He says you can have confidence in the day of judgment because as Christ is, so are you. His righteousness our righteousness. We're part of a kingdom that cannot be shaken and we recognize that even the culmination of everything we know, and yes there's evil in the world around us and there's shaking, but the kingdom of God will not be shaken and will culminate in a new heaven and a new earth and we have that assurance. So we have confidence in prayer. We have confidence today because the scripture says Jesus the same yesterday, today and forever and so today. Today is the day of salvation. So we ask boldly knowing that he gives liberally. We have confidence. So many th things in life try to steal our confidence, circumstances, and even what other people say, and the opinions of others, disappointments in life. Confidence cannot be understated. And when asking God, this petition type of prayer, asking anything, number one, number one, confidence. Number two, perspective. Number two, perspective. We're talking again about three elements to get the most out of this petition type of prayer. Secondly, perspective perspective. In other words, how I see life, how I see problems, and how I see God, and how I see myself, how I see the problem. And that's why it's so important. Remember this type of prayer, give me this day, our, give us this day our daily bread, is the fourth in the, in the sequence of the Lord's Prayer. First we prayed Father, then we prayed Hallowed be your name, then we prayed thy kingdom come, then we got to give us this day. Because going through the first three signs, or the first three parts of the prayer, changes our perspective. It changes our perspective and makes us ready for ask anything. Take Father. Father, in Father, we saw how Jesus changed prayer. Jesus changed the old covenant beggarly style of prayer where we begged and pleaded God and not sure, if, not uncertain if he'd even answer. Jesus changed all that. New covenant style type of prayer, number one, is a relationship with Father. And there's a certainty in that because he is Father. Jesus taught in Matthew chapter 7 in, this same term, in these same lines of thought on prayer. He taught Matthew 7. He said, he's teaching about father and child perspective. He says, what person among you, when his son asks for a loaf of bread, will he give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will he give him a snake? Will he do that? If so, uh, despite, if you do this, he says, despite being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father, who is in heaven, give good things to those who ask him? In other words, he's saying, you as earthly parents, and you're flawed, if you still give good gifts to your children, how much more is your heavenly Father, who's a good father? Not to, I use this illustration, but as a parent uh, with a, of a four-year-old and a two-year-old, sometimes they, you know, the child acts up, and you might get under your skin a little bit, but every morning, uh, I, and I'm certainly not just myself, my wife as well, but, but, but we give our children breakfast, and you know, you would, you, you, you'd be watching today, you should say, well, you know, you're not going to pin a medal of honor on my wife and I or myself because we gave breakfast uh, yesterday or this morning. In other words, in fact, if I, we didn't give breakfast, you'd call child services on us. So it's no big deal to give breakfast to our children even when they've acted up. We still do that and we don't even get a medal of honor. And so Jesus is, con you know, in the scriptures even talk, I use that. The, the healing, something is big to us, and it is a big deal if you're sick in your body, but the scriptures call that the children's bread. In other words, we don't earn what we ask for. Ask by grace. We ask even healing. If something as big as that, he says this is children's bread. He gives it because he's Father. I love what Isaiah said. He said, even before they call, I will answer. And, and, and while they're still speaking, I will here. It's a picture of a father running toward their child with gifts hidden behind their back, just hoping that the child will ask so that the father could produce the gifts that were hidden behind his back. In other words, he already knows our need, and yet he invites us to ask for the need so that he might delight in giving that gift to us. You know, a parent delights, even in the earth, earthly sense, an earthly parent delights in their child being full of joy, child succeeding, uh, don't you? If you're a parent, you get joy out of that. And maybe, maybe I know there's ditches, we can get too much joy out of that and live like, you know, I'm not talking about that, but even, in, even a, 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 just a healthy parent gets joy out of seeing a child, their child succeed or their child, you know, delighting or ha having good things. A, a natural parent, where do you think we get that from? We get that because we're created in the image of God. He gave us His nature. And so how much more does He, our good Father, delight in our well-being? And that's why the Scripture says He 
takes delight in our prosperity and well-being. He gets delight out of giving us good things. So never think you're coming to an unwilling God. No, he likens himself to a father who gives freely, who delights. In fact, the scripture says, we looked at that in the first part of this series, in father, in depth, but he adopted us. He adopted us. We were once not his children. He adopted us as children. And even in the natural, in the adoption process, adoption is initiated by the parent, not the child. The parent initiates the child. The parent chooses the child. And in the same way, yes, we acknowledge Christ as Savior and we, we received uh, our sonship, but we did not choose Him. He chose us. He did it through the cross. He did it through the resurrection. Even while we were dead in trespasses and sin, the Scripture says, He chose us. So how much more now will He freely give all things? So we come with that boldness. This gives a confidence. This perspective of Him as Father gives a confidence when we pray, second perspective change was, is, is that of king. We prayed, our father, I'm sorry, then the second part was hallow. Hallow it be your name. That's the second signpost that gives us a clear perspective. Hallow it be your name. It speaks of our worship. We saw in the second part of the series, we saw in depth, and I'm just highlighting, but our worship means to celebrate the worth of something to celebrate. And so what we do is we celebrate the worth of who God is, how magnificent, how awesome He is. And perhaps one of the best pictures of that worship in the Scriptures is in the book of Revelation, where it says that all the angels and all the created things were gathered around the throne crying out, worthy is the Lamb, worthy is the Lamb that was slain. And then it goes on to show the picture of the Lamb who now holds all wisdom and riches and honor and favor in His hands. In other words, He has all power. He who was slain is now alive, and we worship Him, we magnify Him, we make Him bigger in our own estimation, which, by the way, when we have a big perspective of, when we have a big Jesus and see, have a big perspective of His power, it makes our, the problems, not that the problems disappear, but it makes the problems in our own estimation grow smaller. Our perspective changes. It gives us confidence. Again, number one was confidence. We ask, we must ask with a confidence, but a perspective of this hallow it be thy name, the wonderful Jesus, the, the lamb that was slain, it gives us a confidence. Why? Because we're looking to Jesus. And that's a picture of prayer. Prayer was never meant to be some introspective self-analysis because what happens is when we look at ourselves, we see you know, uh, imperfections, we see incompleteness. We're all in ourselves incomplete, you know. We, we, we wish we were bolder. We wish we had this, we wish we had that. We see incompleteness. But when we look to Jesus, what happens is, as we behold Him, we begin, actually begin to transform. It doesn't mean we just stay where we are, but we start to be transformed. We start to change, and we start to take on His characteristics. So in this perspective, we begin to see Jesus. We begin to, it begins to change our perspective of the problems. We begin to see that He's, he, he, is, he is the one who's helping me. In fact, the scripture even says that Jesus is our high priest who's representing us. So when we pray, Jesus, our high priest, it says he's even interceding on our behalf. If that doesn't give you a confidence, knowing that Jesus is your intercessory partner, I don't know what's going to give confidence in prayer. But we have this confidence knowing he's interceding for me. And he is my high priest representing me, perfecting and purifying my prayers before the Father. That's how to give a boldness and a confidence in asking, asking boldly. And the third signpost we came past that transform, in the Lord's Prayer that transforms our perspective was that of kingdom. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. In kingdom, to have a kingdom, you must have a king. And in the kingdom of God, we have King Jesus. And it says of our king, King Jesus, that in his hands he holds the keys of death and Hades. In other words, that all the evil and all the, 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 the setbacks. In other words, he is the key that unlocks that which has been stolen from you. He is the key uh, to that which has been taken. He is the key that unlocks that which you need in Christ. He has the key of death and Hades. And with that key, he unlocks the blessings of Christ in our lives. A kingdom needs a, a king. And our king, and this, by the way, gives us confidence in prayer because our king, the scripture says, the king of the kingdom of God, King Jesus, he is the head of all principalities and powers. He holds all power. So when we pray, we're not praying to a powerless entity. We're praying to a God who has all power and has defeated principalities and powers. That's why the scripture says that the kingdom of God is not in word only, but in power. And so know when we pray, when we ask, there is power to meet that need. And I was thinking about that 
in the natural. You know, when you, it's one thing for someone to sympathize with you, and we all need, you know, we, we appreciate that. We appreciate when people can sympathize. But, you know, it, it's, 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 there's something lacking when a person can only sympathize but doesn't have any power to help or to change. You think about that for a second. Someone might sympathize with you, but you're still left in that problem. You, it may feel good for a moment, but you're still stuck in it. Well, this is the beauty of the kingdom of God. Not only does he sympathize, and he does. He, the Lord Jesus is compassionate. You saw him in the Gospels, in his earthly ministry. He was moved by compassion when he saw people in need. But he also has power to change, power to heal the sick body, power to transform a broken situation. He has power to rectify, to bring justice where there's injustice. He has both sympathy, but he has power. The kingdom of God, not just in word, but in power. And now we are told to pray in the name of the King, King Jesus, and there is power. He said, ask in my name. John 14, whatever you ask in my name, the name above every other name, that I will do, that the Father might be glorified in the Son. So there is power when we pray in that name, the name of King Jesus. This is to give us confidence. Remember I said, number one, we must have confidence. Number two, and perspective. Father, hallow it. Thy kingdom come. We are part of a kingdom that cannot be shaken, a, a kingdom that is defeated principalities and powers. So that's why we said in previous installations, and I'll say it again here today, we pray from a position of victory, not for. From. We are victors in Christ Jesus. We enforce that victory. We implement that which has been won. We enforce it. Where there is evil infringing on the kingdom's territory, we push back the name of Jesus. The name of Jesus with righteousness, peace, and joy. It's not a kingdom of swords. It's a kingdom of righteousness, peace, and joy. Power in the Holy Spirit begins to transform. Our perspective changes. Before the problem, like this little card here I hold up, problems can, you know, they get so magnified in our eyes that they cover our eyes. That's all we see. And yet before me here is a studio, cameras. If I could see your face, I'd see you. All of that before me, but it's all blocked when all I see is the problem. You see, when our perspective changes, I begin to see how great, great Jesus is and be how, His power. It's like this is taken away and I begin to see all who Christ is and I begin to be able to take care of that little problem. So number one, we pray with confidence. Number two, with perspective. And number three, three points here today, so I'm on my last point. But number three, we ask with trust. Trust. I put trust number three because it's important. We first passed through the first points I've highlighted today. Otherwise, it can be misunderstood. But trust. You know, see, God sees what we don't see. God sees what we don't see. And it's important to recognize that when God gives us what we ask, God gives us as a good father, not as a genie in the bottle. You know what a genie in a bottle is? I put a picture on the screen. It's that, like Aladdin's lamp. You rub the lamp and the genie comes out and you get three wishes. Well, when God gives us, he gives us as, he gives us as a good father, not necessarily, not as a genie uh, in the bottle. He, and as a good father, he gives us good things. He gives us good things. Now, let me illustrate this. I have two children. My wife and I have two children, I should say. You know, Kids think that what they ask and what is good are the same thing. Do you follow me? Kids often think that what they ask and what is good is the same thing. For example, a child asks for ice cream at bedtime. How many know as a parent we recognize not a good thing? Follow me? Or a child asks to play a game of throwing knives at a wall with you uh, as a parent, you recognize, not a good thing. Throwing kids, throwing not throwing kids isn't good either, but throwing knives uh, with, with a child is not a good thing, right? So a good parent recognizes that. But here's the key. A good parent, a good parent, not only recognizes the problem, uh, most parents could recognize that, but a good parent recognizes also the need. Uh, are you following me? In other words, the child asks for ice cream. That's the problem. But there's also a need there. Maybe the child's hungry, so instead of ice cream, might give a healthy snack. Or the child wants to play with knives. Well, that's a problem, but maybe, this, maybe the need that's also there is they're bored. They need some proactive activity to do. And so the good parent will give directed to the need and may even fulfill that need, but maybe not necessarily in the way it was asked. He's been said of God that when we ask God, He always gives. And God always gives full value, 
but not always in kind. What do I mean by that? I mean, you might ask for a thousand, I'm being, being amusing the illustration here. You ask for a thousand dollars worth of gold, he gives a thousand dollars worth of diamonds. What do I mean by that? Well, let's look at two examples in the scriptures. Paul. In the scripture, Paul asked God to take away his thorn in the flesh. He asked to God for that. We're talking about asking anything today and how God answers when we ask. Paul asked God for that. And by the way, thorn in the flesh, we've taught this, I don't have time for it right now. Thorn in the flesh was not sickness, it was persecution, it was opposition. But Paul asked God to remove that thorn, and we see God didn't. But God answered his prayer. You see, what was Paul's desire in wanting the thorn to be removed? Well, Paul's desire was to have an effective ministry, to be effective in the kingdom of God and to have a powerful ministry. God answered that prayer. God answered the desire of his heart, but not in the way that he thought. In fact, God left the thorn there and said, my grace uh, is made strong in your weakness. God answered the prayer but in a different way. But he brought about the desire of the ask. Take even Jesus in his earthly ministry as a man. Jesus, he cried out, the scripture says, in the book of Hebrews, that he would be saved from death. And as a man, I, we can all understand that. None of us want to die. Jesus, in that earthly sense, he cried out that he would be saved from that. Now, what was Jesus' ultimate desire? His desire was to save mankind from their sins. God answered that prayer, but he did not save him from death. And so we see how God always answers when we ask, and he, as a good parent, not only sees the problem, but he sees the need. He fulfills the desire that's there, but sometimes it looks different than the way we thought it was. Remember, God sees what we don't see, and as a good parent, he does give us the desires of our heart when we ask. Sometimes it looks different than we anticipate it. And make no mistake, the good Father gives when we ask. That's why he says you have not because you ask not. So we do need to ask, or, or the, the scripture says we, we don't receive. But our part is to trust that he knows what he's doing and he, he knows best. He knows best. So we ask and we have this boldness and this confidence. And that's why the Lord's Prayer, I think, was constructed. Father, uh, uh, hallow it kingdom, and then we ask. And we, with that, there's a, there's a trust. And, and I, 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 I don't have to belabor the point, but the, the, in the scriptures, not everything is black and white. Certain things are black and white. For example, healing. The scriptures are abundantly clear that sickness and disease are not God's best, not God's will. He didn't bring it. And, and in Jesus' earthly ministry, there's not one occurrence where Jesus said, God's the Father's will is for you to remain sick. No, he healed all who came to him. There were certain people because of unbelief who didn't receive, but that does not, did not indicate Jesus wanted them sick. So healing is a black and white. But there are many gray issues, aren't there? You know, the scriptures don't say whether you should be driving a BMW, a Mercedes-Benz, a Toyota, or taking the bus. The scriptures don't say that, do they? they? They're very unclear about that. In fact, you say, well, God doesn't want God, me to, doesn't God want me to prosper? Well, that, the scriptures do say that. But it has no indication whether what kind of car you should be driving or if you should be taking the bus. Maybe God would have you take the bus to save money so that you can make an investment to prosper. So, again, I don't know the answer. I'm not prophesying to you. All I'm saying is that that's a gray area. And so we trust in the ass. We don't get our nose bent out of joint. I'm praying for a Mercedes and I got a bus pass. We, we don't get a, I'm being, trying to be, I'm being a bit funny here, but these are things that we pray about. It, but you say, well, he didn't answer me. Well, maybe he did answer. And so we trust, we trust. Ultimately, yes, he wants us to prosper, amen? Uh, in other words, we don't always see everything. You take in life. You know, if I look at my own life, when I was 25, I looked back on when I was 15, and there were many things when I, that I looked at when I was 25 and thought, what an idiot I was when I was 15. I, I, I think you'd probably put your hands up too. You would look back 10 years ago and thought, what a... But then when I found out when I was 35, I looked back when I was 25, and I thought, you know, there are some decisions I made, what an idiot I was. If only I'd seen things differently. But then I discovered now in my 40s, I look back to my 30s and think, man, I did some idiotic things. I made some bad decisions in my 30s. And I think that'll keep on going. When I'm in my 50s, I'll probably look back and say, some of the things I thought today, you know, what an idiot I was. I kind, it's kind of the way, because we mature, hopefully, our eyes get open to new things. And, and, we, and so in the same way, we trust God. Maybe not everything that I know, not, not everything that I, that I believe, you know, the, in the way that I ask right now, not, maybe not everything is perfect for my, for my life. So we have that trust level. We have to take that in humility. I mean, I remember there was a teacher I didn't like, and yet in hindsight, 
that teacher was the best thing that I needed. Thank God he's not a genie in a bottle and just took that teacher out of my life and I pray, God, take that teacher out of my life. Best thing that could have ever happened to me. Or, or timing. Maybe you're praying for a spouse and say, oh, I want that spouse right now. But then 10 years later, you look back and thought, man, I'm glad I didn't get that spouse right now. The timing was wrong. I would have made a royal mess of it. God knows it all. He sees what we don't see. And so in the we are to ask. And he will fulfill the desires of our hearts. But remember, ice cream, give a healthy snack. I mean, we trust him that he's going to get us to the place where we're, where we're trusting him. And we trust him in the directions of life. Again, not everything is black and white. And we are to ask, but then we trust. It's like, you know, when you're following a navigational system and you kind of, you put in the GPS where you want to go and you kind of know in the back of your head the directions, but you put it in anyhow. And then, then the G, on your way there, the GPS reroutes you. You kind of, maybe, you maybe get angry at the GPS. It's like, Jeep, come on, what's it doing? I know the way. I, I, but, but maybe the GPS that day, there, maybe there was a, a road closure, a, G, a construction, so it's rerouting you. Meanwhile, you're getting angry at that GPS and you know, it's the same way with God, but you know, sometimes he sees things ahead. He sees, we're praying for that job. If only I get that job, and then it doesn't happen, and we get angry. Well, maybe that company was a corrupt company, or maybe it was about to collapse, or I don't know. We don't see everything, and so we trust him. Ultimately, yes, he wants us to prosper, but it's not everything in the path of the journey there is, 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 is black and white. And so we trust, we trust him. We trust that he knows best. And one thing in life, in the natural, the child who gets most from their parent is the child who understands most that they are that a child or that, that they are a kid. In other words, the child who trusts the parent's judgment is often the one who is the mo deemed the most mature. If, for example, the child who asked for $30,000 to go to university is probably going to get exactly what they asked versus a child who asked for $30,000 to buy a red sports car when they're 16 or 17 years old. You can see the child who understands most that I'm child and my parent, they have a good judgment. That's the child that often gets the most. That's what Jesus, I think, said. To inherit the kingdom of God, you have to be like a little child. Not childish, but like a child. And I think the more we are like a child, the less childish we become because we trust him. We trust his judgment. We think he knows what is best. It comes with maturity. And I love this now, by the way, the scriptures tell us how to, and I'm done preaching now in a moment, but we have some exciting things coming up in the service. You've got to stay tuned. I'm going to throw it to Megan in just a moment's time, a ministry report. But in Hebrews chapter 5 tells us how we mature. It says, everyone who partakes of milk is not accustomed to the word of righteousness, for he is an infant but a solid food, but solid food is for the mature. In other words, we become mature through the word of righteousness. We mature through the word of righteousness. So what's the word of righteousness? Well, the word of righteousness is encapsulated in the finished work of the cross. How Jesus became sin and for us that we could become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. It's a free gift. And in other words, what we preach today, even today, Father, hallow it kingdom come, our completeness, the victory in him, all of that serves to change our perspective to see a God that I can trust and it makes us mature, makes us mature so that when I, we do ask and we ask with confidence and we ask with that perspective of that of a victor and then we trust him in those gray nuances of life when we're asking, we trust him, he knows best and he's directing and he has my best intentions, he is good father, amen, he, he sees the problem, and he gets me to the, to the desire. Amen. Well, I'm done preaching here today. I'm going to throw it to Megan in just a moment's time. Two things. You know, the scripture tells us, Jesus in the scriptures, oftentimes he asks us, or he asked when he was in the gospels, he asked, what do, he came across a sick man. He said, what do you want me to do for you? Uh, you think in the natural, well, he's sick. He wants to be healed. But no, Jesus asked. And Jesus is like that. Even today, through his spirit, he asks us, what do you want? Maybe you're sick in your body. And you say, well, it's a no-brainer, Nathan. I, I want to be healed. Ask Jesus. He says, Heal, che, um, healing is the children's bread. So we come humbly to him and we ask him. Healing is not a gray area. Here, healing is a black and white. God wants you well. In a moment today, we will be praying for the sick. I'll be back again uh, after Megan and we'll pray for you if you're sick. But first of all, the scripture also tells us even forgiveness of sins that was provided through the cross, provided through Christ Jesus, even that he does not force upon us. He asks us, do you want to be forgiven? Do you want to know your sins are forgiven? Do you want to receive new life in Christ Jesus? And I'm here in this moment asking you today, would you like to receive the forgiveness of your sins, new life in Christ Jesus? It's as simply as saying yes, 
I receive. Say yes to Jesus. Say yes to his forgiveness. 